Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Woohoo! Welcome to Adelaide. Beautiful city in a beautiful country called Australia. And welcome to the seventh International Carers Conference. My name is Karen Cook. This is Dr. Moore. Tim. Tim will do. <laughs> Tim will do. You can call him Tim. We are the immediate past presidents of Carers Australia, and we're going to be your MCs for the next three days. You will notice that we're terribly attractive. <laughs> You've never had MCs, which are quite such good eye candy before. <laughs> we know that. So just enjoy it. Two years ago, Ara, who's the CEO of Carers Australia, and Tim and I had the very good fortune to be in Gothenburg in Sweden at the sixth International Carers Conference, at which we got so excited, so carried away, that we decided we should host the next conference. It's hard to imagine that here we are, two years later, and we've done it. It's been an amazing journey. So we want to start by thanking a few people. We want to thank the Carers Australia staff and the board for the hard work and the dedication to ensuring that this conference is successful. We want to thank the organising committee, the scientific committee, who really earned their money going through how many abstracts, Tim? Many, many, many. many. I think many. I'm still going through some. <clears throat> many, many, many. I managed to only be on the organising and not on the scientific. To our sponsors, who have been material in the success of this conference, sponsoring morning teas, sponsoring dinners, but really importantly, I think, sponsoring a lot of carers to be here today. And to, to you, our delegates, because of course without you, we wouldn't have a conference. So we're delighted to say welcome to you all. So our traditional welcome to country this morning is brought to you by a proud Ghana and the Nungaroo man who has just arrived, having been caught in traffic. Jack Kudnuta Buckskin. Jack has dedicated his life to relearning and passing on his knowledge and language to the future generations of Ghana people, especially his own children, in which he speaks the once said extinct Ghana language of the Adelaide Plains. The accompanying traditional dance is proudly brought to you by the Kumakaru Cultural Services. And this will be followed by a traditional response by Uncle Benny Hodges, an Indigenous Carer Ambassador for Carers Australia of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage. I ask you to please extend a very warm welcome to Jack Buckskin and the Kanakaru dancers. All right, how are we all? Good. Yeah, fired up today. Ooh. Um, <laughs> for those that don't know us, um, we're Kumakaro Dance Group. Kumakaro means one blood in Ghana language. And uh, the reason why we have that name is that we represent many different Aboriginal groups. Uh, just between us, we represent about nine to ten different Aboriginal groups. Uh, Kumakaro fits what we do. We're, we're here to showcase our culture, uh, not just one of the communities, but all of our communities, teach people about our um, I guess a little bit about our culture along the journey and when we get to showcase, I guess, our, our, our dance, uh, it's probably one of the best feelings that we can, uh, that we can ask for. Um, we take the opportunity to, to welcome people and teach people something new, uh, every opportunity we get when we, when we perform. Uh, but we're going to start off by just uh, welcoming our guests from uh, whether you're interstate or international, the local guests, we welcome you as well. And we're going to do that through singing a song singing a song to our spiritual ancestors to come and join us, look after us, and also just to let them know that we're about to perform for them also. Part of our culture is we believe in three worlds, our physical world that we all see, the spiritual world that live amongst us, and that's all those empty chairs that look empty, they're not actually empty. And then the sky world, which is like the heavens, and through ceremony and through dance and song, it pays respects to the whole three worlds. Uh, so this is us paying respects to the spiritual ancestors for gathering on the traditional lands of Darnaganyamiana, which is the people of the Adelaide Plains. 
we are Ghana people, but we come from the northern suburbs and we also pay respects to the spiritual uh, ancestors of this country. And um, we're going to sing that song to pay respect to them now. Welcome to country. Alright. So um first dance that we're gonna do for you, um before we go into that, we're gonna pay respect to the traditional owners of the Didgeridoo or the Yiraki. Uh, who are the Yongle people. It doesn't come from down here. We've incorporated it into our dance and it became a voice to relearn a lot of our ceremonial dance. We're slowly starting to put that away as well, but we enjoy playing it that much that we still keep it around a fair bit as well. And it's even, we've got personal connections with it now. Our family that's adopted us into Arnhem Land, um, who give us the belts that we wear as well. Um, I guess they, they ask us to play the didgeridoo or the yiraki for them as well. So the first dance that we're going to do is incorporate the, the yiraki and we'd like to pay respects to the traditional owners. I acknowledge them in their language and in mine. And this first dance that we're going to do is a makandi, which is a show-off dance. And this is a, it's a shake leg dance, so you'll see Aboriginal guys do it all across the nation. Lots of people have different meanings of it, but ours is a show-off dance. All right, it's all about showing off, showing how strong you are, and usually this one's for the ladies, okay? But that's okay, guys. You can enjoy it as well. You can get front and center, ladies. They'll, you know, they'll dance even better. All right, so this one here we call Makandi, the shaker leg dance. Just let me know. Yeah. <laughs> Promise wives and husbands, and I will set them up in 10, 15 years maybe. Um, anyway, let's get past that. Uh, the first, next dance that we're going to do is Makandi, which is our, uh, uh, not Makandi, we just did Makandi, is our Mani Taula, which is our good spirit dance. It's our welcoming dance. We also call it Mani Nabudni as well. This is where we stomp our feet into the ground to get the spirits to fill our vibrations, because our spirits recognize us by the scent that we are, because we are the scent of them. They recognize us by the voice because we have the same voice and they recognize us from the dance and the ceremony from the feelings of the vibrations so this is a dance that pays respect and gets them to come and join us this is Mani Taula, the good spirit dance Mani 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 Mani
This, um, this dance that we're going to do for you is pretty sig significant and special dance for the Guyana people of the Adelaide Plains. Adelaide's original name is named as uh, Tarandanya. And uh, this dance is of Taranda, the big red kangaroo. Half of the name is Taranda, the big red kangaroo. Ganya means the rock. Taranda Ganya is the dreaming place of the big red kangaroo. And that's the na Adelaide's original name. And the people and the spiritual ancestors of this country are known as Tarandanya or Taranda Ganya Miana. So we are um, going to pay respects to the, to the kangaroo, which we call Tanda, because he's the one that gave us law to follow. So this is the dance of Tanda the kangaroo. Any, any many locals around? Check your hands up if you're locals. Woo. People from interstate? Oh yeah, like that. International? Even better. We're going to teach you something a little bit different. Anybody know how to say goodbye? This is mainly to the uh, internationals. Anybody know how to say goodbye in an Aboriginal language? Well, you're gonna. And these are for the interstate mob. This is the local language as well. Adelaide Plains here, we say nakada. Can you say nakada? Nakara means we'll see you again. Then over on the York Peninsula, it's the little leg of South Australia. It's the leg holding up the rest of Australia. Yeah, that's what I want. Yeah, that's, uh, over there we say Nakaja. Can you say Nakaja? Good. If you go down the lower lakes in the Kurong, down there, they're a little bit lazier than us. They just go knocking. Yeah. Probably because they're a little bit closer to New Zealand. Sometimes we get that lazy, we just go knock. Yeah, and that's probably come from them as well. So, but uh, on, on behalf of us, Kuma Carl, thanks for allowing us to come and showcase our culture today. We're going to leave you to the last one, which is our, our goodbye dance, um, which is faring, farewelling our spirit ancestors as well, and letting them join you for the rest of the event here. So this one here is Naka Naka Janakara.
My name is Benny Hodges. On behalf of Carers Australia, uh, we'd like to pay our respects and uh, acknowledge the Ghana custodians of this country. I'd like to acknowledge you, Jack, your elders past and present, and uh, carers in their wisdom always look at uh, being uh, pay their cultural respects to places wherever we go. So uh, we acknowledge your elders past and present, particularly those emerging elders that are coming through. Uh, and uh, we, we do our acknowledgement of your country because you know, you're the keepers of your story, of your culture, of your traditions. Uh, we also acknowledge the rivers, the country, the plains, all your animals, the winds, now with that welcome that blows across us and carries our spirit across Ghana country. We acknowledge that. Uh, we acknowledge you as the Kumagargal dancers and uh, pay our respects to you as well. So on behalf of Carers Australia, we also acknowledge the, our, our international visitors that have come here and join us, particularly on this blessed, blessed country here, on Ghana country. Uh, the same as if they were over on your country, you'd welcome them in your way. This is their spiritual way of welcoming us to their country. So on behalf of Carers Australia, uh, we'd like to say uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, in, in, in uh, my language, when we say welcome, and I'll say it in a couple, there's the uh, Hayerumai from the Kiwis, those, those na ones. Kapu miga batainga, sayonapa, mayem, welcome and good morning. And uh, to finish off, I'll just say uh, nakuruda, nakajak. Can we just ask you one more time to give a very big thank you to Jack Buckskin and the dancers. And now it is my very great pleasure to introduce you to the President of Carers Australia, Dr Peter Langkamp. Dr Langkamp's extensive experience incorporates both the public and private sectors and includes high-level positions at the National Disability Insurance Agency, Shell Australia, NRMA, Accenture and Bendigo Bank. He has also served on various boards and as a carer for his eldest son, has first-hand experience of the issues faced by Australia's 2.7 million unpaid carers. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm welcome to Dr Peter Langkamp. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here in Adelaide once again. And as President of Carers Australia, I welcome you all, um, innovators, service providers, business people, politicians, policy advocates, researchers, health professionals, uh, but most of all, carers and those they care for. I also want to welcome former Carers Australia directors and presidents, many of whom are here today, and as you can see, are not backward in coming forward and taking active roles in this conference. I especially want to acknowledge those of you who have travelled long distances to be with us today and who are probably still physically operating in very different time zones. And this includes representatives of the International Alliance of Care Organisations who have joined us from around the world. For those of you who may not know, this coalition was formed in 2012 and currently represents 14 member nations. It is dedicated to building a strong network of care organisations across nations to share ideas, programs and research and bring visibility and support to family carers uh, around the globe. Of course, caring was once seen as a personal and private matter in family life. From my own experience on the birth of our disabled son Christopher, it was 36 years ago when my wife Catherine and I were thrust into the role of carers. Of course, unpaid caregiving has become one of the most important social and economic policy issues worldwide. The Carers Australia network of organisations are working collaboratively to raise awareness of carers' identity and disseminate best practices and enhance carer wellbeing. And to Minister Porter, we are grateful for the ongoing support provided by the way of national grant payments, young carer bursaries and peak body funding. Now this, of course, the seventh International Carer Conference is the seventh International Carer Conference. When it comes to making a grand statement, or feeling lucky, or seeking the divine, nothing beats the power of seven. Whilst the optimum number of hours of sleep for humans is seven, 
and I suspect some of our organising team have had a lot less than that over the past few days. The number seven is full of symbology, but I like the fact that we're on another one of the seven continents for this conference, and so the debate will no doubt be on which continent the next conference will be held. The theme of this conference is caring into the future, the new world. The question mark was added because although there are all sorts of exciting developments on the horizon, many of which will be explored throughout the conference program and demonstrated by exhibitors, not everything in the carer world is full speed ahead. There are a great many continuing basic challenges that confront carers and those who provide services to them that have not yet been properly addressed. These range from situations such as in Nepal and India where there is no government recognition of carers and no organisations which exclusively address the needs of carers, to countries where previous good access to carer support services has declined as a result of reforms in service delivery and those who they care for. Then there are challenges arising from demographic pressures in both Western and Eastern countries that may lead to the evolution of more carer-friendly employment practices. With rising demographic imbalances between the ageing populations and the number of carers available to care for them from younger working age generations, many economies are facing a challenge with respect to resourcing replacement formal care in the near future. This is especially the case where major traditional sources of family carers, wives, daughters and other family relations are more likely to be in the workforce than previously. As the supply of family members who are able to dedicate their time to caring for someone at home diminishes, economic drivers will dictate that it is important for working age family members to be able to combine work and care. However, the pace at which this transformation can be achieved is still not clear in most countries. There are many opportunities at this conference to showcase and discuss capacity of existing and emerging technologies to increase the independence of people being cared for, to free many carers from being housebound and on a constant alert and to ease the role of caring in other ways. However, we also need to focus on how such technologies can be made affordable to all those who would benefit from them. Innovations in direct support of services to carers, some of whom will incorporate a significant technological element, will also be key to improving carer outcomes. Such innovations are certainly canvassed in this conference. In addition to the very diverse range of interventions covered in these few days in Adelaide, we are very pleased with the inclusive range of carers represented here in terms of presentations and in person. There is a focus on young carers, carers of the aged, carers of people with a disability, carers of people with mental illness, carers of people with dementia, end of life carers, carers from different cultural backgrounds, current carers and former carers, working carers, full time carers, carers from developed and developing nations. The program may be a bit crowded, but there is something in it for everyone. I hope you will enjoy this conference and the delights of Adelaide has to offer, especially this spring. In particular, I hope and expect that the learning, sharing experience and conversations of the next few days, both informal and outside those sessions, will engage, enrich and inspire you, and that you will leave this event with renewed energy, helpful new connections and new ideas for advancing the cause of carers when you get back home. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh Thank you for having me at the 7th International Carers Conference. I'd certainly like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting and to pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge Ira Cresswell and Carers Australia board members and of course the President in attendance, uh, Chief Executive Officers of members of the International Alliance of Carer Organisations, the Honourable Kelly Vincent, and of course all the carers, service providers and stakeholders that are here today. And over the next three days, you will be considering, no doubt, a range of issues concerning the future of carers and the caring community in Australia. And in this short presentation to you today, I'd like to add some observations about the issues that in the coming years will require the considered and cooperative attention of government and the caring community in Australia. But before uh, I and you, over the next several days, dive into considering issues about the future of carers and caring in Australia, it is useful, if not critical, I think, to consider the context of caring in Australia, uh, where we are at and what the issues have been that we have been dealing with over the last several years. 
And over the last four years, the Turnbull government has focused on the overarching problem of the sustainability of the Australian welfare system as a whole. Based on a Deloitte Access Economics 2015 estimate, carers presently provide some 1.9 billion hours of unpaid caring a year in Australia. And no matter how much the world changes, I think one constant that will remain is that there will be a very strong need for carers. And the need will be a growth feature of the Australian society, economy and welfare system into the foreseeable future. Given the importance and growing need for carers, welfare expenditure on carers in the form of carers payment predominantly, but also other related expenditures, are absolutely critical parts of the Australian welfare system. But as important as they are, carer payments, carer allowance and other allied payments are still and will always be part of a much broader system, with many different payments representing different and sometimes overlapping needs. The central problem that the Coalition faced when we came to government in 2013 was simply that the welfare spending that we inherited was growing faster, in fact much, much faster than the taxpayers' ability to pay for it. So when we came to office in 2013, we inherited embedded and ongoing structural spending, which was substantially in excess of realistically deliverable revenue. And under the previous government, social security and welfare spending was growing at almost double the rate of revenue. At an individual payment level, for instance, the age pension under the previous government was growing at 8.2% a year. So that's an, a yearly growth figure of 8.2%. Uh, the disability support pension was growing at 9.5% a year and did so every year for six years under the previous government. Perhaps most extraordinarily, under the previous Labor government, the growth rate in the expenditure on job seeker, so unemployment benefits of a number of kinds, was growing at 13.5% a year, every year, for six years. And that represents growth that was four times the growth rate of revenue over the comparable period. That situation that we inherited was totally unsustainable. And we have been working very hard to reduce that sort of growth rate. And in fact, using the example of unemployment benefits, we've reduced growth of 13.5% a year down to 3.7% a year which represents more Australians moving more quickly through the welfare system and going into employment. And for any government, the result of failing to deal with this type of welfare sustainability problem is the need simply to continually borrow money to fund today's growth. And borrowing money to cover huge welfare expenditure growth means that the next generations of Australians are simply left with no choice but to pay higher taxes to fund the welfare system of their own time but then also fund the welfare system and back pay today's welfare system with even higher taxes. And that, in my observation, is utterly unfair on the next generations of Australians and fails any fairness test and is unacceptable. It's a form of intergenerational taxation without representation. And because welfare spending is such a huge part of the Commonwealth budget, our successes in restraining the growth in welfare expenditure have been a frontline contributor to the fact that the Turnbull government now joins the Howard government as the second only of the two modern governments to have expenditure growth lower than revenue growth. And in the year 2018-19, the government will no longer be borrowing to fund recurrent expenditure in the welfare system or elsewhere. And that, I think, is probably one of the best and undersold pieces of news for every young Australian because it represents an end in sight to the intergenerational cost shifting that's been going on for far too long. It also means we have a more sustainable footing and foundation for considering how we cope with and plan and pay for future demands on our welfare system. And that brings me back to this obvious point about the growing need for care in our society, particularly care for people with a disability and care for the elderly, both which are issues at the forefront of your conference over the next several days. The ageing of the Australian population will put increased demand on carers, which is already, I know, stretched. Again, using that Deloitte data, they forecast that between 2016 and 2025, the demand for growth in informal carers will increase at a faster rate than supply as a proportion of people aged over 65 increases relative to the rest of the population. Of course, we are now right in the middle of Australia's substantial and core response to the need for caring uh, for those Australians with a disability in the NDIS. 
And in one year, we have moved the NDIS from 30,000 participants in trials to over 100,000 participants, and we are moving full steam ahead towards full scheme participation of over 400,000 participants in the year 2020. And perhaps the most important benefit of the enormous effort as a government that we have taken to get the welfare system on a sustainable expenditure footing is that we are in a far better position to responsibly pay for the NDIS without further borrowings, which again simply require a future generation of Australians to pay back our welfare system of today. As we fully roll out the NDIS, of course, the expenditure on the scheme is increasing rapidly as more and more people join the scheme. Uh, that is necessary and in a personal observation it's interesting to me when I look at the NDIS that this was the last part of the Australian welfare system when it should have actually been the first part of the Australian welfare system. But in any event, imagine if we had been confronting all of the new expenditure on the NDIS while we were still facing yearly growth in areas like unemployment benefits expenditure of 13.5%. That would have been an almost impossible challenge without more and more borrowings and all of the intergenerational unfairness that that would have entailed. So on top of the huge efforts to restrain welfare expenditure growth to reasonable and sustainable levels, this government has still had to make the very tough decision to increase the Medi -Levy, Medicare levy by 0.5% to fully fund the NDIS rather than simply leave the problem of its funding to future generations to sort out. There is no dispute about the virtue of the NDIS, and I would also note that the recent Interim Productivity Commission report said that the tracking to full scheme is, is on track and inside budget. But the NDIS must be paid for, and we are the generation of Australians who must sort out how it will be paid for. And I must say, while I have a gathering as august and large as this, that it is very, very pleasing to note that the increase in the Medicare levy to fully fund the NDIS has been supported vocally, publicly and unequivocally by a range of organisations, including many in this room. That support has come from people with Disability Australia, Every Australian Counts, the New South Wales Council for Intellectual Disability, National Disability Services, Mission Australia, Uniting Care Australia, the National Ethnic Disability Alliance, Disability Employment Australia and the Disability Advocacy Network have all supported the government in what is clearly a challenging decision to increase the Medicare levy by 0.5 per cent to fully fund the NDIS. I'd also note that equally it has been incredibly disappointing that the policy to fully fund the NDIS has not been supported by the opposition, by the Labor Party or by ACOS, both of which fully supported precisely the same policy in 2013. So I renew my efforts at every occasion such as this to see if we can get that type of support from the Labor opposition and from ACOS. As a final important matter for consideration, we face a very significant paradox which I see around me all the time in a variety of electorates across Australia. And that is, as the NDIS moves rapidly to full scheme, we are going to require 60,000 new jobs. 60,000 new jobs will be created in disability care. And at the same time, we are facing contemporaneously very poor rates of employment for carers, particularly young carers, once the care relationship that they are involved in ends. So this government sees that as a very significant priority to both fill those 60,000 jobs but ensure the best employment outcomes for carers and particularly young carers. And we've already taken a number of important steps in great cooperation with ARA and Carers Australia to address the issues facing carers today with very special attention being paid to young carers. I just wanted to mention a few of those and announce a few new measures. Um, we've set up the Carer Gateway and the reason that we did that is because we became aware that 80% of carers were not aware of the support and services that were readily available to them. So that is why the Australian Government set up a national online and telephone support service, the Carer Gateway, to support Australia's 2.7 million carers. The Gateway website has advice on what help is available in a carer's local area from all levels of government and what type of assistance is available which is specific to their particular caring role. Since the Carer Gateway was launched nearly two years ago, it has had half a million people use it. Um, so it's a very positive initiative. 
The Carer Gateway was the first phase in developing what will be a new integrated plan to improve the way we deliver support and services to Australian carers. My department has conducted an extensive co-design with carers and with the sector to develop a new service model. The aim is to develop a model which better coordinates carer services and ensures carers' needs are recognised and supported. Importantly, there's a focus on early intervention, so carers know and benefit from available services as soon as they begin their caring role. Present carer services are funded in Australia with about $160 million a year of taxpayers' money, and they include counselling and peer support and emergency respite, but ensuring that we properly connect carers to those services is a key piece of a jigsaw puzzle which has been missing up until this point. I'd also make, like to make some brief note about young carers' bursaries. We as a government are acutely aware of the pressures that young carers face, and some of our most important work in the carer space involves efforts to address issues for young carers. Become a carer, becoming a carer at a young age must absolutely not be allowed to constrict a person's long-term future. The Young Carer Bursary Program was a 2013 election promise to support young carers to complete or return to education while continuing in their caring role. Uh, we of course know that education plays such a large part in the future of young carers. Unfortunately, a very high proportion of young carers do not finish high school. Carers Australia has been delivering the $4.5 million Young Carer Bursary Program on behalf of the government since 2015. Annual bursaries of $3,000 have been awarded to young carers aged up to 25 to help them continue their education. More than 980 bursaries have been awarded to date, with a further 333 to be awarded later this year. An evaluation of the program last year found that bursaries do help young people stay in education, and we found that young people receiving bursaries spend on items such as transport, education supplies and medical expenses, and they are able to devote more of their time to study. During a recent meeting I had with ARA and with Bursa recipients and Carer Australia, it was explained to me that it was hard to get prospective employers to understand their caring commitment, the caring commitment of young carers, and have that count towards their suitability for a future job. And as a result of that meeting from this year, bursary recipients will receive a formal governmental certificate recognising the valuable contribution they make in their caring role while they've been completing full-time study. So I'm hopeful that that very small formal token of recognition, which was an idea from a young carer who'd received a bursary, will mean that Australian Government is giving some further assistance to young carers in terms of a practical help in their job applications to prospective employers. Thank you. It's good to get a clap for someone else's idea, so I'm always happy to take that. I'd like to finish by talking about the Tri-Test Learn Fund. So the need for even further support for young carers is emphasised in, in the findings of a very extensive analysis that we, the government, undertook as part of our broader welfare reform agenda to help rather than hinder Australians' wellbeings inside the welfare system. So in 2015, we undertook an analysis that was um, driven by PwC, and that was an analysis which has formed the basis of what we have described as the Australian priority investment approach to welfare reform. And the analysis showed that the total lifetime cost of every single human being in the Australian welfare system at the moment, across their lifetime, would be $4.7 trillion. The idea is that if we can find groups inside that larger group and give them assistance and help them move from welfare to work, then we can greatly benefit them as individuals, their families, but obviously the entire Australian society. But the priority investment approach rests on very um, sophisticated predictive modelling and expertise, which is generally used up until this point only in the insurance industry and by actuaries to understand future welfare paths and the outcomes of welfare recipients. And we looked very carefully at a number of groups and what that data analysis revealed were that young carers are particularly vulnerable to the risk of long-term welfare dependency and all of the adverse effects that that can have on their lives and those of their families. The priority investment approach data revealed that as things presently stand, young carers are expected on average to be on income support for 43 years over their lifetime and that 1,800 current young carers will remain continuously on income support for every day for the rest of their lives. And that is a terrible result for those 1,800 young carers. 
That very worrying information comes at a time when the number of young carers in the welfare system is rapidly rising, and in fact it has tripled in the last decade to 11,200 young carers in the system at the moment. The priority investment approach data also showed that only 27%, so that's just over a quarter, of all people under 25 who receive carer payment will study beyond high school. So by not furthering individual educations and fulfilling their potential, young carers can become isolated, they have far lower job prospects in the long term and far higher welfare dependence, which unfortunately welfare dependence is of the type that is very much handed on to children into the next generation. So if nothing changes for those young carers, two thirds of them will still be on welfare in 10 years and half will still be on welfare in 20 years time. And that is a, an, a, a terrible result and one that we are squarely focused on as a government. So what have we decided to do about that? The data shows us what the problem is. We use the data to, to identify groups that are of absolute priority need of assistance and young carers are one of those groups. So we selected young carers to be one of the three priority groups for an initiative known as Try, Test and Learn. The Try, Test and Learn Fund is a $96 million fund and it is there to allow for the applications of innovative initiatives and collaborative policy responses which target three critical groups of which young carers are one at the critical point in their lives which can allow them to transition and prepare for employment and have far brighter futures. The two other groups are young parents and young students who um, have failed their studies or are failing in their studies and end up on new start or youth allowance. So in last year's budget, we allocated that $96 million. Now the TTL fund, the Tri Test Learn Fund, is for community, non-government organisations, state and local governments, private sector organisations, who offer us ideas with input from young people themselves to come up with new ways to improve the lives of our target groups. And what we will do is that we will fund and test those programs, see what works and measure them using our actuarial analysis. And potentially, if things work, we will roll them out on a far wider basis. We will be looking for substantial, measurable improvement in individual human lives and the lives of these individual young Australian carers. So I'm very pleased today to announce that of that $96 million fund, uh, the first, the very first three programs are being announced and funded. There'll be many more to come, but the first three are being announced today and they all relate to young carers. I'll just give you a quick description of each of them. Uh, the first is something that'll be called the Carer Achievement Pathway and it's a program that's been developed um, in cooperation and with ideas from carers in New South Wales. $840,000 is going to be provided from the TriTest Learn Fund to deliver a combination of support services such as coaching, coordinated referrals and peer networking opportunities, which will allow about 360 targeted young carers in Western Sydney to plan and specifically build their future beyond their caring role. The program will particularly assist those whose care recipients are an NDIS participant. So those 360 young carers are providing care for someone who is moving into the NDIS and we think that that offers a critical point to try and lever greater opportunities for long-term employment for the carer, for the young carer. Um, the program will be underpinned by a digital platform which will allow young carers to access online support uh, and be engaged predominantly online. The second funded new program is going to be called Skills for Micro Enterprise. And that is a project which has been developed by Good Shepherd Microfinance, Spark Strategy, Little Dreamers Australia, Coda Factory Academy and Young Change Agents. It will see the application of 800,000 go to help around 90 targeted young carers in Melbourne. And the idea is that those young carers will be assisted to learn the skills needed to create and run a small business. And they're obviously also very relevant skills to other formal types of employment uh, that the person might eventually go into. We will be using multi-channel training modules, support services and peer networks to increase young carers' social connectedness and their preparation to be able to run a small business. The final project of the three that we're announcing today uh, is described as data-driven job opportunities for young carers. Uh, this project has been proposed by IBM Australia, Chandler McLeod, the Institute for Social Science Research and Curtin University. 
It will be funded with $2.1 million and it will be targeting 65 young carers in Perth and it's using data analytics and augmented intelligence to provide job matching, tailored training and individual support with six months of post-job placement support to increase the likelihood of success of those young 65 carers in their new employment. It also has a re-entry component that will ensure young carers have multiple opportunities to continue employment if their circumstances change. One of the features of that program, as I suggest, as a noted, suggested by IBM, is that they will data scrape a whole range of um, employment websites to try and find the right jobs for those young 65 carers. So these are very innovative, very new, uh, and they will be very rigorously measured programs to see what is working. Now obviously this is a start and um, there will be many, many more to come and all of them will be measured to see what's working. But if we can find programs like that, that work and roll them out on a larger scale to those 11,200 young carers that we know are so desperately in need of our assistance to create better futures for themselves. I think this is a very, very exciting path forward in terms of helping people help themselves and their families grow better lives. So those projects will see over 500 young carers participate in innovative solutions to assist them stay in or move into education or work or transition from welfare payments into employment. And the sense that I get is that those young carers have much brighter futures ahead of them because of this expenditure and this very innovative policy. So let me just say thank you again for the um, pleasure of being able to be here and address you. With the proportion of the population that are requiring care, which is increasing as we know so rapidly, we must look at innovative ways both of caring but of supporting carers in their role and for life when that role transitions into other phases in their life. So we have to recognise the role of carers in the total care system and never forget that carers also need to be supported and cared for and that care is a phase in one's life that often ends and transitions and particularly for young carers we have to make that transition into employment and a, a bright future as assisted as it can be by government. So I have great pleasure in opening your conference formally and wishing you all well with your deliberations over the next several days. Thank you again.